getting all that experience as a player and seeing all the mistakes I made. Now as a coach, you have that different perspective. So when things aren't going well, you can kind of figure, figure the path forward. It's something you can look at and say, this is what we're working on for the next three months or longer until we get it better. Once we get it better, this needs to improve. I learned so much from Kay just with everything he did and his determination and, and you know, the Japanese culture. You mentioned differences there, but what were the key kind of similarities you saw across those those few players that you work with? So, I think with Kay and with Michael, just the... Do you think these guys always believed that they could make it to the top or did you see doubt on some occasions? So there are ways to handle the stress. You've got to make sure you control what you can control. You've got to take care of those parts. Did you, while you were playing, did you ever think that you might become a coach? And then when you did come to that decision, why did you actually decide to become a coach? No thought whatsoever. I was uh, 30, 31, and I had a lingering wrist injury that just wasn't going away. And ranking was drop. It was ranking was dropping. Everything was kind of going sideways and kind of got to the point where I'd taken a long period of time off, started the December, you know, preseason and one or two weeks in wrist injury came back again. So I was like, can't deal with this. I kind of don't have, you know, to start over with that protective ranking, just to claw my way back to 200 where I was at the time just didn't seem, you know, I just didn't have it. Now, this is where I could have thought, okay, let's, let's do the doubles then. But I was at IMG and, and I, you know, I had this kind of talk, this discussion with red who said, Hey, I mean, come work for us. We're going to take care of you. You know, we're your family. We've always been your family. Um, we're going to mentor you, you know, you're going to do what you want to do. We obviously have, we need you. We, we have a, we have things that are very similar to what you were doing, which is we need you to coach the top juniors. We need you to travel with the young pros. This is going to be perfect for you. So I said, I said, yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a great idea. And, uh, pretty much for the first couple of years, I was like, I hate this. I don't know how to coach. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, this is all new to me. I, I miss kind of being the boss and taking a vacation just because I don't feel like playing tennis. Now I got to ask for vacation times. And it was, you know, it was, uh, it was a brutal kind of two years of, of going into something new, even though it was obviously very, very similar. I just, I didn't have the passion for it. I didn't, like I said, uh, it was, it was just this, it's, it's very tough when you do something your whole life and, and, you know, you're the center of attention, even though it can be terrible. Like I said, uh, I, I hated tennis. I hated losing it. But, but when you win, you know, there's so much passion and joy. And, and so it's all, it's all emotion. So this, this was something new for me that I struggled with definitely for the, for the first couple of years. And what kept you going during that time? The, you know, the support from IMG, um, all of the coaches, it, and, and again, when you, so I was a top junior and when you turn pro and you're not doing well, you, even though the IMG coaches for the most part were still supportive of me, like you, you feel, you feel it. You feel that people that's, that's the thing with sports or, or with tennis is when you're not doing well, you know, that's a reflection of you as a person, which, which is always very difficult, um, as a tennis player. Like it's a wonderful thing. You're doing what you love. If you're successful, it's, you know, it provides opportunities. It's amazing. But if you're not doing well, people judge you, you know, and you might judge yourself when maybe if you're winning, I'm this great person, you know, and I can do all these things. And, and so you can misbehave or think you're the S H I T, but when you're losing, you know, you, you feel it too. Oh, he's lazy. Oh, he's that type of human, you know, that type of person as a coach for the most part, like the people are very supportive of, of trying to, you know, especially at IMG, you know, if, if the, the kid I'm coaching is losing, we're, you know, we're having group discussions on, you know, on, on how to, 
how to improve the kids. So I felt it was very, very team oriented and I had the support. So even though I was struggling how to coach or what, you know, I remembered all these drills I did as a junior, but uh, am I just, you know, am I just hitting play and doing, you know, the exact same stuff or am I trying to make this kid better? How do I get better? Um, how do I become a better coach? And, and, and from that aspect, just that support is what kept me going in the, in those down times when I, when I felt that I wasn't adequate or, or an expert at doing my job. Yeah, I guess, obviously, like you say, as a player, you're, there's that direct accountability, right? Either what, like it's the two sides of the coin you're doing well. You're like, Oh, I must be doing some things right. If you, and then if you're losing matches or you're not playing very well, you're like, Oh, I must be doing something wrong. Um, whereas I guess as a coach, you, you can see the effect you're having, but maybe it's not quite as clear cut. I, I don't know if you agree with that. It's you're just able to look at it from a different perspective, you know, very easy for a coach to say, yeah, this kid is just not doing what I say, or, you know, this kid is late. You can easily transfer any of the blame to the kid. Obviously you should never do that, especially if they're young or old, like basically the perspective should be, okay, things aren't working. How do we, how do we turn the tide? How do we make things work? Hey, listen, I've been through it before. I've been through all the losing and the down. I now have a different perspective. I can look back at my career and say, ooh, as a tennis player, I mean, just a, an easy, quick story. I was in my 20s doing well and playing the LA Open at the time, which was a tour event. And I had lost to Krychek 7 6 in the third. And then I was playing Nicholas Kiefer and I lost 4 and 4. And Peter Smith, my coach, was helping me during those tournaments. And he came to me and he said, hey, if, if, if I know you're going back to IMG, but if you just do this, and add this to your game. I mean, that match you beat Kiefer. If you if you just add this to your game, I'm in my 20s. I'm a tennis player, and I have a totally different perspective. And I'm like, I hear what you're saying, but if I had just served a little better and made that volley, I was up four two or four one in both sets. Like, I just needed to execute better. So, getting all that experience as a player and seeing all the mistakes I made now as a coach, you have that different perspective. So when things aren't going well, like I said, especially when you have a support team, now you can kind of figure, figure the path forward. And, and yes, those first two years, I just felt a little bit, I, I never felt overwhelmed. I just was like, am I doing it right? Do I need it? I always was like, can, how do I do this better? Like, do I, should I change up the drills? You know, you just, should I keep doing this drill? Should I change it up? Should I be doing something? What is that coach doing over there? And basically what you do is you learn, you look at the other coaches, you you ask questions, you, you learn new things, you either accept them or don't accept them. And you, you realize that it's a process and that you, you've got to keep improving just as, as the player needs to keep improving. Yeah. Staying, staying curious, I suppose. And yeah, just trying yeah. to learn. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, when we talked when we talked to Diego Moyano, he said one of the key things is learning how the player needs to hear the message, right? The, the communication. That's one of the hardest things because you can't be inside their head, right? So again, that's where the kind of building that relationship is also key. Um kind of and learning how they how they receive messages or how best to deliver that message to them. Um I don't know what what, what do you through your coaching career, what did you kind of learn were key kind of principles or philosophies that maybe you had um that helped you as a coach yeah um having a purpose and having a way to be accountable for every practice and every match it, it keeps your player accountable it keeps you accountable so just being able to reflect so having a purpose for the practice for that match and then reflecting on it and kind of saying, you know, and, and for me, another extremely important thing, I, there are coaches who, who do know it. Like I said, I was someone who always was wanting support so that even if the player and I disagreed with it, we could say, Hey, we're not going to listen to that, but, but getting it together as a team so that we had more information. And so for me, one of the key things was, was having our sports psychologists help us coach and play better. Um, and we had, or we had 
Angus Mugford, who, who moved on, but, um, but, uh, his and, and Duncan Simpson, they kind of gave us these, these, these structures that we could use to get ready for practices, get ready for matches, reflect on them, and then be able to build off of them. And, you know, and so with purpose, being, a, being able to, to have these things proceed through the year, but realizing this is how we're going to get better every single day. Even when we get worse or play worse, even when we have setbacks, this is the you know outline slash structure that's going to show us how to get better. And so quickly, you know, the the structure is 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 multifaceted, but basically, you you are going to have these big goals of being a certain ranking, you know, th those outcome goals, winning a Grand Slam. But if you look at someone like you know, uh, whoever these great players are who haven't been able to win a slam because you've got three of the top players, how do you keep getting better when you can't reach that outcome goal? And that next one is the performance goal. So I'll be able to win a grand slam if I serve really well. And if I can hit these spots or if I can do my serve plus one. And then in order to get those performance, how do you serve well is having those process goals. So this is what we're going to do to get that serve better or this, you know, or to get faster or to be in better shape or to be mentally more resilient. And so kind of having that accountability of something you can look at and say, this is what we're working on for the next three months or longer until we get it better. Once we get it better, this needs to improve and having it very structured, accountable, something to look at, something to go over and reflect added with that, you know, video work to show because some of the stuff you need to improve is strategy so being able to show do you see that you're not doing this in the match we have talked about it i know you're frustrated you're lost but here is the evidence of what we're trying to work on how we're trying to be more aggressive or whatever we're working on um being specific about that and and just holding everyone accountable yeah, I suppose, yeah, it's having those clear kind of expectations or a target and also knowing where you are at that time. But I guess it is also kind of, you've talked about this before, it's difficult when you're playing almost every week, you're playing matches and tournaments and you're trying to change things and you might, yeah, like you said, have to go backwards before you go forwards. So that's always a difficult thing to kind of broach with a player, I suppose. Oh yeah. And, and so again, when I talk about getting support, obviously IMG is where I work, worked and I had a ton of support there, but I've coached a lot of Americans and going over to the USTA and just listening to their philosophies and accepting their help. I learned more things, you know, and, and you talked about tournaments, but you've got to, you've got to rate your tournaments, you know, uh, if you're playing in the juniors, you want to have this great ranking. And by the way, junior tournaments last all year long. There's no off season. So when are we going to get better? So yes, we would love to do well at the U S open, but shortly after that are Eddie her and orange bowl, which are also very big right after that, Australia starts. So you have to rate the tournaments and all of those warm up tournaments that, you know, come right before the grand slams or before your grade A's, you have to have a talk with your kids saying you might not do so well in these tournaments that we are going to go play. The reason is we're going to change some things that need to change. You're going to test them out in these tournaments and you might fail, you know, but the idea is, is that we have to improve. These are the changes we need to make and we have to accept the failures that again, everything is a value, uh, winning, losing those all, give you information that if you use correctly are extremely valuable. Did you find that a difficult conversation, especially to have with uh, junior players, because it's often harder as a, as a younger person to put aside the short term thing, right. And kind of see that longer term or have that longer term aim, especially in, I don't know, today's world where ev everything's almost instant, right. It's hard to, put aside the short-term satisfaction of winning a match or doing well in a tournament versus what your actual long-term ambitions are? Definitely. So 
I sound great right now and wonderful and smart and a successful coach. And the only reason I'm able to tell you all this stuff is I can, you know, give you list by list of the juniors that I don't want to use the word I failed, but I wasn't able to do it. And I learned, you know, okay, from that experience, how am I going to, if I'm either still with this kid, reach him and convince him, or how, if I'm not with the kid anymore, how am I going to now use that experience that I just learned of kind of failing to do what I, I wanted or needed to do for the kid to improve as a coach and give that kid or the same kid uh, a better chance to succeed. So yeah, it's not easy. I have failed at trying to do it. I have failed, you know, when I was first a coach, I didn't even know what I was doing. So I had to learn, ooh, that was not the right approach. This is the correct approach. Oh, this is the correct approach. I wasn't able to implement it. If I know the correct ap approach, how do I get it implemented? You know, uh, everyone could have a great plan, but you've got to be able to implement slash execute the plan. Were there some <clears throat> key things that, that helped you to, to broach that then in terms of getting them to see that bigger picture? D did it involve get maybe the, the rest of the support system, you know, like their parents, et cetera, like what, what kind of key things helped with that? Yeah, definitely the use of, of, of the support team. So again, uh, our, our sports, our mental conditioning person being able to kind of like clear, uh, clarify the goals or clarify, you know, the situations where we're able to talk it out and, and kind of see that longer term vision that's needed, uh, versus, Hey, we're trying to win the orange bowl. Th that's great. But, you know, we're getting ready. We're getting you ready for the pros talking with parents, uh, having other coaches who are experts kind of add to that. Hey, this is what we, um, think is best. Uh, and then bit by bit, you know, showing uh, also showing other pros what they're doing and, mm -hmm. and how that's going to, to, uh, to make you a more, you know, well-rounded full kind of being able to do everything tennis player, kind of having that growth mindset and, and also just knowing also your, your player's own personal kind of his own, his or her own personality. And then knowing whether you've got to go super hard or, you know, more subtle, but, but gaining their trust is, is, is obviously going to be step number one. And then the convincing can take time bit by bit. Yeah. I think that's, this is what makes being a coach so interesting, right? There's so many different aspects to it. You kind of got to, you got to ha have knowledge of, all these different areas obviously you don't have to be super deep because you can always you know get in contact or use people in that support system but you've got to kind of know the the personality and the player and then know kind of what things within that are going to help them so i think it, yeah it's just you're almost like a, a psychologist as much as you are a coach Definitely. in that respect i mean i like i said support team our sports psychologist started either giving me books or recommending me books to buy while i was on the road with these players and I mean, I was reading that more than, you know, buying a tennis book. I was, you know, how do we change the path so that they don't have to, you know, just simple things. Like if you, if you take them to this thing, they'll do it, but they're not going to do it on their own. So how do you just get them, you know, you got to change their environment so that they will do it because they've sacrificed a lot. They have they have the discipline. Otherwise they wouldn't be playing tennis for three hours a day, but if they're not doing the cool down or if they're not doing a certain exercise or if they're, you know, whatever it is, if you can alter the environment a little bit, then it's super easy for them to, well, not super easy. Nothing's ever super easy, but easier for them to get that habit and then kind of make it part of their routine. Yeah. So if we, if we then take it forward from, coaching those juniors so you then obviously it's well known like the players on the tour that you've coached um nishikori nishioka michael mo etc what kind of things did you take from that time those earlier years developing as a coach that then helped you build 
these successful relationships with these kind of top tour players. Yeah. And that's where, like I said, I, I was extremely fortunate for in a way, the timing, you know, and the support of IMG in getting to coach these great players. Uh, I learned so much from Kay just with everything he did and his determination and, and, you know, the Japanese culture and, and, and then being able to be with a lot of Japanese players, because there's a, a program with IMG, uh, the Morita Fund, where they, they have a lot of Japanese players come through. So Nishioka, who totally different personality to Kay, but some similarities in, in, in kind of their, their fight and their, they've got a little bit of nastiness to them, which is a great thing to have. Uh, to being around all of uh, kind of the top IMG juniors, who I could name a ton of those that I was with. So then being with Michael Moe, who, you know, that was a, a special five years of, of really the trust and the, the partnership was there and the challenges were there. Um, uh, so, so those relationships, they really taught me a lot, just how different these, these players were. And I mean, I learned, maybe I learned more from them than they learned from me just in, in how to be a better coach and how to learn how to, how to teach people and connect with people, I, you know, and I think, I think one, I don't know how great a coach I am. I, I know a ton of other coaches who I think, who I know, obviously we don't need to name the obvious ones who are coaching the, the top players, but even coaches who are, you know, coaching juniors, like I see them and, and I admire and respect and, and I'm jealous of, of how good a coaches they are. But I think I was, you know, very good at, at connecting with with the the players that I was with, which I feel when you had that trust and 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 I didn't have an ego like that goes a long way to to creating a good partnership with with a player or with the, or with a group of players. So, what were the key? You mentioned differences there, but what were the key kind of similarities you saw across those those few players that you worked with? The competitiveness. Um, their athleticism, you know, from, from a young age and their, I would say Nishioka was, un, you know, he was always overlooked, which I never saw it. And, and the coaches who were most close to him working with him always, he was always, if you want to call it over, you know, exceeding the expectations that agents or, or, or sponsors might have, you know, they were like, he's too short. And, and I was like, but he is beating all of these players and he's fighting his butt off and, and he's only going to improve, you know? And yes, there might be some limitations, but if he keeps working at it, he's, he's gonna, he's gonna be this tough out all the time. And he, I mean, he's proved it. And then some, I think with Kay and with Michael, just the, the physical talent from a young age was, was 100% evident. Michael's just physical, you know, stature that was always uh just natural and evident uh, they hated losing i think k was was just he's kind of special and i don't know i i can't tell you what it is but for the three years i was with him there was only one match that he slightly gave up on and you know and he didn't give up but you could just see he didn't every single match he played even if he was going to lose, it was every single point was, you know what I mean? It was, he was almost desperate for the match not to end. Like you could just see, he just didn't want it to end. Just give me one more chance to figure out how to win this match. I don't know if it was because he loved tennis or hated losing or the way he was brought up. He had to respect the game, but I can't tell you how many times he lost the first set six, one, and it would just, I, I knew that it was going to be seven, six in the third, you know, even because the player was so good that he was playing, but this was going to be a battle. Um, that was a special quality he had. Um, Michael dominated juniors. And I almost feel that that, and it was with, it wasn't a complete domination, but he was able to compete at such a high level. And he had a lot of great, uh, uh, opponents, you know, like the Fritzes and Tiafos, and they were all in this group and, 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 um, Tommy, uh, wow. Blanking on his name for no idea why, but 
just a great group of players who were always competing with the internationals. And uh, I think he was so good, so young that it was almost like, you know, do I need to improve that much? I'm, I'm kicking butt type thing. And so, and he's had injuries that have kind of slowed him a little bit um, with his progress to, to kind of getting up there as quick as the other guys did. Do you think these guys always believed that they could make it to the top or did you see doubt on some occasions? There's, there's always doubt. I even remember being with Kay. Kay's another person who had, I mean, he would have had an unbelievable, I think he's one of the most talented players who's done so well because he's been injured every single year of his career. Uh, and not like one week injuries, you know, they're like three month injuries. So what he's done, I think, unfortunately, you know, uh, and I'm, again, I say this as a compliment. I think he's an unbelievable player who, if he was healthier longer would have, would have man done a lot of amazing things. But with K with those injuries, he would come back, lose a couple times and, and he would s straight up say to me, like, I don't know how to win. I'm not confident. And again, we would go to our sports psychologist who, who had the answers and he would go, man, I just saw a video of myself winning. I'm freaking good. I'm ready to get out there and, you know, and prove it. Uh, and I think he had that mental strength and resiliency once, you know, once he was convinced he was good again from these injuries that he would go out there and, and be ready to go. Um, Michael would take a little longer with these injuries as far as getting his confidence back. But then once it's back, he he's able to kick butt. Um, so just I, like I said, so doubt is always there. I think, and this is not me saying this, so I don't think uh, a, a very good pro I know who's extremely intelligent kind of said those years of, of 20 to 23 or, or 18 to 23, when you're, when you're figuring out who you are as a player and, trying to make these jumps. Those are the important years of, of where you get your belief when you make your jumps, because it kind of works in a double way. One, if you're not winning, you're losing a bit of confidence. And then two, your opponents are seeing you're not winning and they're thinking they can beat you, you know, and then they're making jumps. And if they've made a jump and you're at this ranking and they're at that ranking, they're kind of believing that they're ahead of you type thing. So, so belief is a, is a fragile thing and it's an important thing and and you're going to need to bust your butt and and really have the mindset of how do i learn from this and improve from this and find that belief and make it and keep it consistent yeah the reason i ask it is because obviously uh putting the fan hat on as you know just watching these players play it out in the biggest tournaments on tv you kind of it's easy to forget that they're just going through like a human experience like the rest of us right and they have they have all these normal doubts and not just kind of like bulletproof um i think it's also become clear like you know if you watch the the breakpoint kind of documentary that gives you somewhat a, a little bit of an insight into the day-to-day -day kind of experience that they go through and there's a lot of pressure there as well so you know they aren't just yeah they aren't these robots we can kind of we kind of turn almost turn that switch off when we watch top players play be it tennis or any other sport that we just expect them to perform right but yeah. they're just going through these same experiences that we go through yeah i mean they're great they should perform great every time i think tennis is so tough because it's like a postseason it's a it's a knockout tournament every single week and there's only one winner and I, you know i guess what's good is you know in the nba now you have this off season but i i think that's great for for these other sports where you can take this devastating loss in a, in a tournament in a, in a knockout draw and kind of get away from it and refresh your batteries and, and kind of come back with a, a renewed sense of purpose. You can really get away. Uh, now they're, they're team sports. So if anyone on the team is not, is not putting in the work, you're affected by it. So in that regard with tennis, it is on you so you can control things, but Every single week, it's a postseason tournament knockout where you failed. And when you win, guess what? That's not good enough. What are you going to do next? You know, if you win a Grand Slam, oh, you won a Grand Slam four years ago. When are you going to win your next one? You know, so the pressure is right back on. 
Um, it's never good enough for any, you know, for anyone, the media, the sponsors, again, it's still a wonderful opportunity and it, and it provides you with, with everything. But like you saw in the documentary, I mean, the pressure that these athletes are under is like enormous and, and some basically need that pressure to perform a little bit. And some shy away from that pressure as soon as they get a bad call or as soon as they're not as confident and suddenly they go in, you know, these big losing streaks and, and your girlfriend or your boyfriend broke up with you and, or they want to see you and, you know, you're getting pressure to see them or something happened in your family. There's just so many things that, that affect your mood. Uh, You didn't sleep well. There's so many things that stress you out and you've got to perform every single week. Otherwise you're out. So it's just, it's very stressful. It's very tough. And, but that being said, there is a structure that you should follow to kind of help you with being able to, to handle it in a way. The first thing is knowing what you can control. And so, you know, a big key to being mentally strong or mentally ready is to be in great physical shape. So that's, that's step number one. Like I can't tell you how many players, Kokonakis, for example, when I was at IMG and he was there and he was in the best shape of his life, he was like, you know, tennis for me is so less stressful when I'm in great shape because I don't feel like I need to hit winners. And I was like, this is coming from a guy who hits the crap out of the ball. You know, (laughs) he's not a, he's not a counter puncher. He's a guy who can serve you off the court, hit forehands and backhands, rip you off the court, come in and finish the point. Like I look at him going, Oh crap. Like my player has to play him. He's going to get hit off the court. But even a guy like that, when he's in great shape, he's not as stressed because he feels like he doesn't need to overhit. Or if he is overhitting, he can dial it back, make balls and run all day. So, so there are ways to handle the stress. You've got to make sure you, you control what you can control. You've got to take care of those parts. Yeah, the, well, talking about pressure, that actually leads me on to one of the final questions, which is, do you see, obviously there's a, there's a lot more, uh, social media is obviously plays a big role in kind of the modern day. Um, and I don't know, did, did you see any major differences on the tour compared to when you were playing to when you were then coaching these guys in recent years in terms of maybe the social media, just the, the general TV audiences, the attention, D- did you see major differences between when you were on tour and, and now and kind of what effect did that have on the players that you worked with? I mean, obviously major differences back when I played, I didn't even have a cell phone. Then I got one, but it was, you know, just that, that very, <laughs> very basic one with, and I was actually thinking at that time, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, you could go on the internet or, or watch a movie on, on a phone, you know, and, and then as soon as it happens, it's just like, yeah, this is totally normal. <laughs> but so it's kind of a double, I'll give a double answer. Yes, it's totally different. And in a way, what you would, the first thing you might say is you would recommend to the player or this or that to stay off of social media, you know, because obviously you're getting all this hate with the, with people who gamble, you know, right away, as soon as your match finishes, whether you win or lose, you're going to get just a bunch of messages from the people who've lost money that you're the worst human being in the world. You suck. We hate you, blah, 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 blah. So then with social media, you know, you're the center of attention. You got to look good. You got to say cool things. It's very distracting. Um, so it's a huge difference. It's, 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 uh, it's very distracting. That being said, I do think we as humans adapt to whatever, you know, we're doing, um, uh, I don't know how much Djokovic or all these players are on social media, but it exists and he's the greatest ever. And Rafa is the greatest ever. And feds, the greatest era in this era of social media. So whether you need to be more disciplined or you look at all the great athletes, they're on social media and they're adapting and, and handling it. And it's, it's there, it's not going away. And obviously having someone grow up and, and teaching them how to be responsible on it or have it not affect them as much is the way to go, but it's there and you've got to adapt. So it is different, but the players today are different. I think they have a lot more advantages they do, uh, than, 
back when I played. Back when I played, everyone was retiring at 30. Now we have way more information about how to be a, a, a better athlete, a healthier athlete, and players are playing to 38, 40 and, and winning, you know? So, so there's yeah. a lot more advantages now as well. Did uh, the guys that you work with, were they on social media much when you were working with them? K K was on not so yeah K was K was in his chat groups and and he was online. Um, Michael yes as well. You know uh, some of those key things are like fantasy football. So there's there's things there's distractions where hey Michael it's Sunday you know you're in the final. <laughs> fantasy football is not going to be something that is important to us correct. Um, but I would say, yeah, uh, Nishioka and, and Kay were on the computer. They were, but, I don't, you know, maybe they were just watching shows they really liked. It was, you know, a way for them to escape. Again, back in my day, a lot of players I know were going out to bars and, and you know, and drinking. And obviously that still happens today, but but you can kind of stay in your room and and, and kind of interact with tons of people now online instead of going to a bar where there's smoke and there's alcohol and, and, and that kind of thing. So you still had your, your, your bad, uh, uh, distractions back in my day for sure. But, but were they aware of, were they more aware of what was being said about them than perhaps you were when, when you were playing and did, did that affect them maybe day to day when they turned up for training or could you notice any differences on some days versus others? Not necessarily. I remember Michael a few times uh, once he started, you know, getting up there and we're playing, you know, important matches. I, he did show me some of the the hate he was getting. Um, but I think I don't I, I don't I might be wrong. It didn't seem to affect him, you know, uh, necessarily as much. I didn't I didn't work as much with female players where I think, you know, and, and any player who takes it personally, to be honest, I take a lot of things. When people say negative stuff, I do take it personally, which I shouldn't. So I might have been one of those players that was affected by by negative social media. Yeah, I think some of us are naturally more sensitive, I guess, than others to, to these yeah. things. But um, yeah. I think that's also where that, like we said before, that support network and system becomes so important, especially for younger players if they're growing up you know, on social media to like, they're still figuring out who they are. Right. And so it's important to have people around them who can help them deal with it, I guess, and, and rationalize some of it because yeah, if you're still figuring out who you are and you're getting all this kind of feedback, it, it's just not a natural thing to have like thousands or millions of people giving their opinion on you. And you're, I don't know, like a, as I say, 16, 17 year old and still figuring out who you are. It can be quite difficult to process that. Definitely. And I think, you know, the tour also have uh, their support. You know, I, I know in the meetings there's, you know, hey, you're going to go through a, you know, a social media uh, kind of guidance with with one of our tour people and, and kind of just to kind of show you around and, and kind of help steer you clear and help protect you. Yeah. It's not perfect. It's it's, you know, but nothing is <laughs> you can only try and you know minimize the downside and still try and take advantage of the things that it does give you like you said before so yeah, yeah. awesome well thank you very much for your time i think we've got to wrap it up there as there's, there's always thank so much you. to talk about so many things that we haven't yeah. talked about that maybe we can talk about in the future um but yeah really appreciate your time and um yeah we'll hopefully get you on the podcast again soon great thank you so much i Thanks appreciate so much. it